everyone, and welcome to Designer by Designer, ILD's new series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with and by lighting designers around the world. My name is Sophie Charvin, and I'm joined by Alicia Davila. Together, we coordinate the Eastern Canada chapter, and we are very excited to welcome you to the first interview in this series with Jared Winmer, ILD from the ILD Board of Directors, and Alexandre Touga, Associate ILD from the ILD Eastern Canada chapter. Before we begin, we would like to thank our sponsors. Designer by Designer is made possible with the support of our platinum level sponsors, Lutheran Electronics, Lumen Pulse, Axis Lighting, and all of our gold and silver level sponsors. Today's interview is being broadcast on Zoom, is being recorded and will be available later to view on YouTube. Jaren and Alexandre will be answering questions at the end of the interview. So if you are watching with us on Zoom, please use the Q&A option throughout the interview. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Red, Jared Whitman and Alexandre Tuga on the first interview of ILD Designer by Designer. Welcome. Thank you, Alicia and Sophie. Bonjour, bienvenue, hola. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And on behalf of the ILD Board of Directors, I'm excited to be part of this event. For those of you I've never met, uh, my name is Jared and I'm really looking forward to kicking off this series with all of you. Alex, thank you so much for being here to kick off the program. It's great to virtually meet you. Yeah, it's great to be here. It's fun to start that thing off. <laughs> for sure, I was practicing a little of my French. Yeah, thanks. Really, it's appreciated. You, 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 you have no idea how much it means. Well, this is new for me, but we're going to try this out and see how I do. You can grade me at the end. Perfect. <laughs> we'll ask you some questions in French at the end. Ah, okay. We'll see how that goes. Just to get us started off, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little about your company? So I'm Alexandre Touga, a lighting designer from Light Factor. It's a company that I have founded uh, back in 2011. So we just turned uh, 10 years uh, last, I think, November. So yeah, big cake, big party uh, with ourselves, unfortunately. <laughs> but yeah, that, 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 that's pretty much uh, yeah, why I'm in the company. But, Exciting. 10 years already. Time flies. Oh, so. my God. Yeah. <laughs> well, before we get into all the hard hitting questions that I want you to answer, I figured I'd start us off with a quick little easy icebreaker, a little this or that, where I'm just going to give you two words and you tell me your favorite. The okay. audience will get a little idea of kind of who you are, I think, through this. Okay, perfect. Go. Right. Some easy ones. Winter or summer? Oh, my God. <laughs> Okay, can I, can I have a third, can I say dry? Dry. Because I can have a winter, a dry winter and a dry summer, but a humid winter and a humid summer, it's, it's impossible to live. All right. You're already breaking the rules, but- we'll Oh yeah, you know, I like to break the rules. <laughs> All right, here's an easy one, I think. Wine or beer? Oh, beer, craft beer. That's I'm with you easy. there. Yeah. For sure. City or country? Oh, I, oh, wow. Okay, I didn't see that one coming. Uh, I say, uh, I would say city, micro level. Just having the conveniences of what a city offers rather than the peace and quiet of the tranquil countryside. But yeah. <laughs> All right, how about cats or dogs? Oh, cats. Okay. Yeah. I have two cats myself. So yeah, we we have one. Uh, the, I, I like the independent. Chat or chien, yes. Yeah. Chat or chien. We oui, chat. All right. How about let's get into a little lighting. White light or colored light? Oh, white. God, white. <laughs> All right. How about this one? Um, hockey or football? I'm talking oh. soccer, not American football. From the from from the north, it's hockey. I figured that might be your answer. <laughs> you get kicked out of Canada, I think, if you don't say hockey. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and the last one for you: incandescent or LED? Ooh, incandescent. All right. 
Nice, nice. I like those answers. Well, I think now I can get into some of the other questions I have for you. I think you'll do pretty well. I, I think these will all be uh, really interesting. Okay. So uh, you mentioned um, that you're in Montreal. Is yep. that um, where you were born and raised? I was born in, a, let's say, a, 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 a suburb of Montreal, the Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu, which is, let's say, what, 45 minutes from Montreal. So, yeah. All right. One of, the, um, one of the things that I always think about, and it's something I ask a lot of my peers when I'm at an ILD Enlightened conference, is how you ultimately got into lighting. As a child, what did you want to be when you grew up, and how did you end up discovering lighting? That's a fun one. You know, uh, back in the days, I, I had an uncle, which I always kind of put on the pedestal. Uh, he had a great career, worked for big companies, and he was an accountant. So until college, yeah, I wanted to be an accountant. So for two years, yeah, college is two years here. Uh, so for two years, I made myself believe that I wanted to be an accountant. So, but when I started to realize that I was always mixing active and passive assets and liability, I figured that I should never be a good accountant. So I went to look for programs and there, there were three that were really interesting. There was a cinema at Berkeley University, which I could never afford. Uh, media technology, which was given in a town that was somewhat seven hours from my home. And let's say back in the days, I was pretty a uh, stay at home boy. So that was a no. And then there was the uh, theater production, uh, production course in which I enrolled. And honestly, at the beginning, I was there to hang fixture and focus them. And I liked, I, I liked it. But in our second year, we kind of touched lighting design and there it was, you know, the, the power of designing to, to have an idea and to realize it and to try to, 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 to share it with others through your medium. And my medium is clearly lighting because you, you should see my drawings. You don't want me to draw you something. Awesome. It's so funny to hear how people find lighting sometimes very roundabout or un non-typical ways it's mm. uh, yeah. not all not all of us fall into it early and as a child so um, no and there's a, a lot of different paths even even here as as a professional lighting designer now though you know is there anything specific you know anyone or anything specifically that inspires you um in, in your everyday life Yeah, there, there, there's someone, you know, who, who really inspires me for, I would say for the last 20 years, uh, I had the chance, as soon as I finished school, I, I had the chance to, uh, to work at Cirque du Soleil as an assistant lighting designer. Uh, and I was there from 2001 to 2007, I think doing four shows, uh, Varekai, Zumaniti, Ka, and then Corteo. And uh, I have to admit that I have the utmost respect for Guy La Liberté. He is someone who has a vision. Uh, he knows, he knew where he wanted the company to go. The company went there. Uh, he has a decisive opinion. He shares it, but he, he, you know, he doesn't like, he doesn't always like everything, but he tells you why. And he's always right. Oh. Uh, I have to agree, uh, yeah, the Guy La Liberté, I have, uh, yeah, he, he inspires me a lot, just, you know, from being a small boy back in the, the, in, in the country to, to head the, one of the biggest entertainment company, yeah. you know, just believe in yourself, believe in what you're doing, and believe you're right. Absolutely. There's something so mesmerizing about Cirque du Soleil and the shows, I mean, the lighting weaves into the story, into the acrobatics. It's such an immersive experience all around and how that really develops into countless shows. It, it's amazing. Yeah. I'd say the, 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 the most important thing that I've, I've learned at Cirque is good is not good enough. It has to be perfect. If you're satisfied with good, that's not going to make it. You always have to push the boundary. That's a, that's. Definitely very true. And I think it's a great philosophy, a great way to approach everything we do. Yeah. 
in the lighting design that you do and the work that 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 you that you're fortunate to work on, you know, what is there one thing that you can identify or one thing that stands out that you like most about being a lighting designer? I I I have to agree. I I do like the the, the collaborative part. You know, when when we're all together in a room and we're trying to 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 work on a project, even though lighting design, let's say, I wouldn't say that it, it comes at the beginning. It, it mostly comes after the beginning and uh, maybe at the end, but to be there and to hear about the project, to understand where everybody is going, to be able uh, after that to, to help them achieve that. And uh, on another note, you know, it's, it's to be able to put the final touch on the project. Uh, lighting design for me is like putting a varnish on a painting or on a furniture. You can use the best oils, you ha can have the best painter, you can use the, 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 the nicest wood, but if you don't apply carefully the varnish, you can destroy all of everybody's good work. So uh, yeah, it, it comes with the burden of not having the possibility to fail, but I embrace that. You know, it's, it's, it cannot be good, it has to be great. But when the final touch is done and you look at the project and you see, wow, that, that, that's the satisfaction that comes from it. I definitely agree that the idea of collaboration, sometimes you get stuck in your own head sometimes. And I think the collaborative pr process allows us to kind of get that outside input. And it, either it's going to reinforce what we were stuck on or it's going to shake us loose and let us see something new uh, in that process. Yeah, for sure. In, in, in the work that you uh, that you do, um, we all have, you know, a variety of projects we work on. I know I think you do a lot of exhibit and museum work as part of, of your work. Um, if you could design lighting for your dream project, no holds, no limits or anything, what type of project would it be and why would you choose that type of project? Hey, this is recorded. So if anyone does that before me, I'm gonna come back. <laughs> It's been, you know, honestly, there's a couple, uh, it's been a couple of years that I'm thinking about, you know, uh, I've always dreamt to be able to work on a project which would put some of the master's paintings under different kind of uh, lights. I've, I've always wondered if the painters always use the same lighting to paint. And, you know, we obviously, well, first there was, let's say, not electrical lighting, and obviously the lighting can change the perception of the color. So let's say, for example, there's a sunset. The nicest moment is there for what, five to 10 minutes? So it's basically impossible to have created a big painting in that time. And day after day, the sky is changing, it's cloudy, and there was no iPhone back in the days to take a picture. So they must have finished the painting in another time. So did they painted it under skylight, but we are looking at it under halogen, so around 3000 K, or they painted it under candlelight and it is hanging in the natural light museum gallery. So I don't know, it, it's somewhat, let's say more of a intellectual project. Would it ever come in reality? I don't know, but I would like to have a, a, a room full of paintings that shows, let's say different kind of lights and lit them under different light conditions and to see how the pigments react. And, you know, th yeah. That's a, it's an interesting take. I don't think I ever really thought about it. You know, if you look at a lot of the classic paintings and realize that some of those masterpieces were developed over such a long period of time. It wasn't, you know, you sit at the canvas and the next day you have this beautiful work. So um, now that's a, an interesting take on that. And I think that would be pretty neat, pretty cool to be able to experience something to see how those famous works really could be could change under those different lighting conditions. Yeah. The um, one of the things I always struggle with, you know, being a lighting designer is when you talk to the non-lighting world, when you talk to architects, even or family members, uh, or engineers, is it? I think there's a a lot of misconception about what we do. I mean, what do you think is one of the most common misconceptions that people have about lighting and lighting designer that they're not they don't take seriously, maybe or understand? Oh, well, I'd say that the first, I, I think first they, they think that we are electricians. My, my, own, my own girl at one point, a couple of years ago, said, yeah, my dad's an electrician, he, do, he does lighting. 
Uh, yes, but no. <laughs> uh, I would say even some, some clients think that, that, yeah, that we are electricians or even electrical engineer, that we, could, we can do the, the engineering of the lighting. So yeah, I, I would say that's a big misconception. Uh, another one, uh, clients that thinks that we, I, we, we are paid uh, by the manufacturer or depending on how many fixtures would be, would be built to the client. And at one point, yeah, I, I explained to the client that say, no, I'm, I'm an independent lighting designer and we do offer a service and we will not be paid by the quantity of fixtures. So it's funny, he never called back. <laughs> But that would be a great subject for another time. You know, if you're designing lighting, you can't sell fixtures. But yeah. that's a big can of worms, I believe. Yeah. No, I, as I say, I, a lot of my university friends, uh, when we hang out, they all their misconception, they always ask me, are there enough foot candles in here? <laughs> I'm like, I do more than just understand the amount, the light levels, you know, yeah. it's about how you layer and use light as well. But um, it's, it's still some, it's a hard aspect to, under, to understand for some. Yeah, I agree in museum. Yeah, but we're, we're pretty used to 50. So, you, you know, in museum world, it's 50. 50 is, is, is the top. So. Yeah. <laughs> Lux, not foot yeah, count. Lux. Ah, that's right. <laughs> so one of the other topic, one of the other things I think has, has definitely affected us as lighting designers is COVID, of course. Yeah. Um, it, it's really kind of impacted how we work and how we do things. You know, many designers and firms are now working remote or in a very hybrid working environment. Um, how do you think, you know, this whole remote work um, ha has impacted uh, your work process and how have you worked around it? Yeah, at one point we always had we always have to 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 stay at home. So yeah, I, I I'd say that the the designing part is, is a bit uh, harder. You know, to share ideas. There's nothing like to be able to to sit down uh, around the the same table, and you know, share ideas and jump on someone else's ideas and and just let's say stole the pen and just draft over it and. You know, through Zoom, uh, it's like, oops, was I, am I on mute? Do you hear me? Is my camera on? Uh, can you share your screen? Uh, it kind of, you know, you, you're into a way that, okay, we're creating and then, uh, oh, mic, uh, oh, video, oh, share screen. Uh, it kind of stops everything. So I, I think it's harder. And for me, uh, what I had to, 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 to establish is that, you know, being the, the lead designer, I, I had to, to, to supervise everyone. So I have to be able to give some time to everyone, but I also have to keep some time for me. But in an office, it's easy. You close the door and you have the time for yourself. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 through Zoom, Skype, Teams, whatever, you always forget to put your yourself at non-available or whatever. So there's always pop-up questions, phone calls that, that need an answer. So yeah, that, that part to be able to get some good time of uh, reflection and thinking uh, for myself was a bit, uh, well, yeah, it was, was a bit harder. And yeah, to create uh, through Zoom, yeah, it's, it, it's hard to, to get the feeling. Yeah, yeah, the, um, you know, to, to your point about being able to sit around a table to sketch ideas together and share, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, we can use Zoom, but We've been, you know, trying to find different tools that how do you sketch in the digital age, you know, with tablets and on screens to somehow you, still convey the same ideas. Yeah, how do you test the fixtures by yes. Zoom? <laughs> yeah. Yes, we had fixture like fixtures being delivered to our homes. And then, you know, unfortunately, you know, you're trying to convey it through a video screen to the others in the yeah. office. And we know that we know how good video is with light. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And contrast. Yeah. Yes, it's it's horrible. It's very challenging. So aside from COVID, you know, which has been a challenge in itself, you know, is there any other aspect to, to being uh, in lighting design that you find challenging in a good way that, you know, so, you know what kind of motivates you to keep going that you find challenging in your day-to-day -day life as a lighting designer? Ooh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, what motivates me? I, I'd say that as we are doing a lot of exhibition design, lighting, 
I think there, there's not many people that does that. And all of our clients or everybody who, who works for us, uh, with us, are uh, they're really happy that to have us on board and to, to, to be able to help you know, the scenographer or the, the, the director to help them uh, realize their vision and to, to, to make it happen. You know, someone has an ID, but they don't know how lighting works or how to do it through lighting. So we come up and we arrive and we make it happen. And there's a, there's a satisfaction for me to, to help uh, or, you know, we're in a, in a service business. So to, to, to serve the purpose of the, the project. I, I'm not here to do the lighting design of the world or to, you know, to have my face or my project over all the news. It's there to serve the purpose. If, if what we do serve the purpose and it, it, it gets us an awards, well, good. But if, if, it, if we do lighting design and it doesn't serve the purpose, what's, what's the purpose of doing it then? Yeah, the motivation behind it is definitely, I think, you know, an important aspect of it. You know, I think myself, you know, when I work on projects, I always want to put my best foot forward and do a great job. And it's mostly, it's not for recognition or publicity, but I always think if my mom were to walk down the street or walk into that space and see the light and I want her to be proud of it. Like I want to be able to show her, hey, look, this is what I do. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And be able to do wow. You know, it comes back to Guy La Liberté. It's, it, if, if we're doing something and we just, you know, and we're, we, we are not our, ourselves, uh, let's say, uh, wowing at it, why? Yeah. I think thinking about that, you know, and, and the work that you do, um, you know, technology is evolving. Of course, you know, we do a lot. There's a lot of LED used. Do you use LED technology a lot in your exhibit work or, you know, because it doesn't replace halogen, of course. No. Um, and I have to say, you know, in museums, there are people called conservators and they are pretty much conservator. They're, they, they are not, let's say that we they're not on the cutting edge of technology. You know, that, that's the way we did it and it works. We may keep it going this way. And the, the problem is that it, it's getting hard to get some halogen and the fixture doesn't re respond. Sometimes the, the fixture doesn't respond well to LED technology also. So it's, it's a work in progress, you know? The good thing is that there's no UV and there's no IR on, on uh, the LED. So that, that's a good thing for us to bring to the, to the conservator, but sure. yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. And the problem I believe is that, you know, there's always a, a, a run to who's the power, the, the, the most powerful, efficient lighting. But in our world of museum, we don't care about power because we have to bring it down to 50 lux. So whatever is over, let's say, oh, we deliver 5,000 lumens for 12 watts. I don't care. I need 1,000 lumens. Give me quality, not quantity. Give me a nice beam. Give me a, a, a nice CRI. Give me dimmability. But don't give me 5,000 lumens. I don't need it. I completely agree there. You know, products that we use, that we love, I go to use again and they put in a higher powered LED chip. And I, I'm like, I don't need that much light. Can't you just give me the six watt 500 lumen product? I don't need it to be thousand lumen. Yep. <laughs> uh, well, one of the other um, aspects of all this I that I was thinking about, and I, this might be a little more challenging to answer. So I might stump you here. Okay. <laughs> You know, lighting is to some extent a universal language. You know, as humans, you know, we all need light to see. Um, and I always wonder whether, if you think where we live, whether it's Montreal, Beijing, Copenhagen, Mumbai, New York, you know, does the region around the world where we live really impact how lighting designers do their work or how they design or how they look at lighting? I would have to say yes. And I would also have to, to uh, go further than that is 
let's say let's say in, in Beijing or Shanghai, you, you're hired to design uh, lighting uh, for uh, an exterior of a building. You're gonna have to look at what's happening beside you, and you want you're gonna want to be your client will want his building to be shinier or brighter than the other ones around. So it's kind of only of a an escalation. It only it can only go up unfortunately. So depending on, I guess, in which city you are, and if the city has a lighting plan, it, it has to, let's say, to, 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 to arrange how you do lighting or how, what you can, you know? Yeah. Um, I guess in Montreal, we don't do the same kind of lighting that we do in uh, Shanghai or Beijing. I was in Shanghai in 2010, and my God, or uh, a week ago, I saw a building in, on LinkedIn, and it was like a up light in blue, whatever. But my God, there was some, uh, let's say, skylights. Uh, it's kind of a, a light pollution all over the place. Yeah. But it's what it was like. Okay, we don't care. We want our building to be brighter than all of the other ones. But God, the sky were, was blue. Yeah. Uh, I was gonna say, yeah, when I w visited Shanghai a few years ago, I was, it was my first trip and I was just mesmerized by the amount of lighting in every building. It's like one building was brighter than the next. It was, it was beautiful in a way, you know, there was just a, a lot of variety from the light source to the color, even color temperature. Um, but there was a lot, it was hard to focus on one thing with so many buildings lighted up, lighted. So, but um Trying to think if I have any other really pressing questions. <laughs> Maybe a closing question before we start to wrap this up. You know, if and this this might not be uh, totally applicable to you, but if you could go back in time to when you first started in lighting and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, <laughs> I, I have to say, uh, have fun. Always have fun. Choose the projects on which you're going to have fun. You can have nice client. They will understand what, what's, your, what's your worth, what's your value. And I'm not talking about uh, money here. What, what's your plus value in a project? Uh, these last few years, uh, we've had some, let's say, less pleasant project which really made me decide that uh there was some clients that uh, i would not go work with just just because you know okay go go get go get a rep or go get an agent and, and he, he, he will do that for you i i'm here to help you if you don't want to listen to me or to listen to what i say why 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 am i doing this you know, it's it's much more about the quality than the quantity, and that, that's what I, I I'm always saying. Uh, I don't want to do a million per year. I, I I want to have project in which we are having fun, in which we are uh, getting let's say recognized by by our client, by our peers, and you know, yeah, let's keep have fun. Yeah, great philosophy. I love that. <laughs> oh. Oh, well, I guess that that sound, you know what that means? We are yeah. going to wrap this up. I know there's probably some folks listening in that want to ask some questions. But before we get to that, we're going to do a quick round of what I'm going to call enlighten us. And what I've got here are four quick questions uh, to ask you. They're just quick answer. You can say yes or no. Um, and the question is, do you want to enlighten us? You can pass on, on one of them. If for some reason you don't want to answer it, you can say, I pass. Okay. But um, it's just four, should be pretty easy. So first question, have you ever turned down a lighting design job because you didn't like the client? I think I answered that in my last answer. <laughs> and I, that's an easy one. I would say, yeah. yes, not, yeah. not a client, but uh, a project. I project say. type, yeah. Mm -hmm. A little trickier one. Have you ever ignored a client's request to change an element of your lighting design because you knew as a professional deep down your solution would be better? No. no. But 
I explained to him why his solution would be bad. He still wanted to do it. He has done it. It looks bad, but now he's coming back every time when he has a project. Ah, uh, lesson learned. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good to know. All right, how about this one? Have you ever been arrested? Uh, no. Oh. It depends on what level. You uh, know? Yeah. I, I kind of got arrested because I, I, I kind of somewhat do a, did a stop uh, three months ago. But yeah, the, the cops pulled me. But more than that, no, not really. I, I'm told. I told you, I'm a home, you know, homeboy. Oh, you did want to be an accountant as a youth, so you yeah. probably weren't out getting into mischief. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I couldn't travel. All right, last one. Name an architect. You just don't get their style of work. I will pass on this one. Okay. All right. All right. We'll give you that one. I did say you could pass on one. Well, I really appreciate you taking answering my questions, Alex. It's been awesome. Um, but now it's time for us to turn it over to the audience and see what questions they might have here. Sure. Um, I know, and I uh, this is new for me, so for all the audience members listening, I have to read through some of these questions. Okay. Um, I know uh, Felipe said thank you, but he had to go. Mm -hmm. um, but I know someone's interested to know a little bit more about the uh, the gentleman was from Cirque du Soleil that you admire so much. Um, they can you spell that person's name? Um, uh, Guy Guy La Liberté uh, uh, G U Y L A L I B E R T E. Awesome. Thank. But he he had I think. He, he has sold Cirque a uh, couple of years ago. He sold his parts, or his shares at least. Yes. We have a question from Germany. Um, and the question is, hi, I come from Germany. And unfortunately, most of the time, just the Lux number is important. What is your suggestion regarding the lighting design in this case? How is it possible to change the way of design? Um, wow. It sounds like they're very, you know, the, the, the clients and the projects are most interested in the functional light levels of the space. Um, and I think there, you know, there's definitely the possibility of focusing on the, on the lux or the, uh, or the light levels of the space while still providing a comprehensive design that balances some of the other needs. Would you agree? Yeah, I'd say that it, 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 that's, that's a fun question because uh, I never really. I never design with Lux. I, somewhat, I like you know AGI or Dialix. I, I use them to validate some IDs, but I, I never design with AGI. I design with you know with with my head, with my feeling, with, and then I figure, okay, I have that room. If I put that many, okay, do I have enough? Yeah, I have enough. Go, and I. <laughs> how to change this hmm i guess it's a philosophy it's it's uh, right. it, it, it it won't be easy to change if that's how it's made in in germany yeah yeah i i i, I definitely i think to that question thinks i i do have some clients that their primary motivation in us working with them is that they say we want this many lux or this many foot candles in the space and that seems to be the, the most important thing to them. And um, to your point, Alex, you know, those are the, not the types of clients you really enjoy working with probably as much. I, I think, you know, I think many of us as designers, sometimes you do take those projects, it's a necessity. And in some regions, it's probably the priority and the more the norm. But um, I know that we still try to look at the lighting holistically. And as you point out, we design based off of the architectural space and the feeling that we wanna create. And then we then go backwards and say, okay, can we achieve the functional light levels, the lux that the client's requesting? Mm -hmm. And then we try to communicate that back to the client saying, hey, we've given you the lux, but we've also, also created a beautiful space for you. 
it is tough, especially if the budget's very, very tight and, um, and it requires a lot of creativity. Yeah, yeah, a lot, yeah. Um, I don't know if I see, um, oh, here's another a question from an anonymous attendee. Oh. Uh, hello, Alex, thank you so much for sharing. I'm curious what is most important to you when specifying a certain product or solution? Oh, well, it depends on the purpose of the, the, the fixture that we're specifying, but I would say, let's say in the, in the museum world, uh, we're trying to get flexibility. If in a fixture I could get a, a, a great CRI, a, a Zoom, uh, accessories, you know, barn doors, top hat, uh, louvers, gel frame, I, I would say that, that, I, that yeah. That's that's what I'm looking for, and and dimming on the fixture. Yeah, I think dimming is definitely a critical component to all of our designs. You know, yeah. to the point that you know manufacturers are continuing to pump out more and more lumens from these products. Um, projects that we never used dimming systems before, we're putting dimming into these spaces. Um, you know, we do a variety of spaces, but even retail, you know, some some types of retail spaces where we might not normally dim. You know, we definitely need that level of control and it's a critical yeah. component to make sure your your luminaires uh have a good dimming driver yeah and it dims down nicely you know not choppy at the end yes yeah. i find that to still be a struggle with some of the projects we work on and ensuring that you get some clean smooth dimming control to the low end yeah yeah especially let's say in the in the in an audience or in a, a theater room, you, you want to be able to, to dim to zero with no flickering at the bottom. Yes, yes. We do it, some of these theater spaces and, and that the house lighting, it's a struggle because many owners want LED uh, for the maintainability of it, but it's you have to be very selective and careful in your selection and your yeah. process. We, we, we did one and I'm not gonna name names here, but uh, if you're looking for one, call me. There's one that uh, that we were extremely satisfied with. It's good to know. I I might actually reach out afterwards. Perfect. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's a theater company. Ah. Uh, that they know they mean. Yes. So I don't see any other questions here for all of those uh, all of you here. If if you have any last questions for Alex, any tough, super tough ones, please feel free to add them to the chat window. Please ask question to Jared too. No, I'm off limits. <laughs> no, we are paid overtime now. Let's keep going. <laughs> well, I, well, other than that, were you going to test my French? I, I probably will fail. You'd have to keep it very simple. Okay. <laughs> uh, quelle est la température? Oh, gosh, I already failed. Never mind. How's the weather? Uh, uh, it's hiver. Hiver is winter, right? Yep. Hiver, autumn, été, printemps, janvier, <laughs> février, mars, avril, mai, juin, juillet, uh, août, septembre, octobre, novembre, décembre, kind of thing. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> we really, we everyone really gets to listen to me chat. practice my French. <laughs> My four years of high school, grade school French. <laughs> yeah, good, good, good. Uh, what else can I ask easy in French? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard to ask, to, to think about an easy yeah. question. Do you think, well, here, just going back, since we'll, we'll talk lighting a little bit, you know, we have a lot of clients, you know, there, there's something about color changing lighting that, a lot of people really enjoy. I think um, to a certain level, color changing light, especially particularly in exterior environments, give clients the ability to, uh, I guess, connect with the community by expressing themselves for holidays, for yeah. certain moments. Do you think it's here to stay or do you think, you know, color changing lighting, everyone's just going to get tired of it eventually? <laughs> uh... I'll answer with a quote that someone told me once, you know, uh, you know, a mirror ball, 
Mm -hmm. Everybody loves them beside the designers. <laughs> and they're still there. Yeah, you're going to say. So I, I believe everybody beside the designers do like the, the, the color changing, or let's say, I would say, let's say half of the people, they do like it. And yeah, I think it, it's there to stay, but I think it's it's our job to let's try to just I would say in French encadre just to, to 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 help you know decide which color should be there and which color should should we not use and at least give an RGB white and a nice yes. white. Exactly, they That's can the always done now. Yeah. Absolutely, RGBW, RGBA, you know. Yeah to be able to get a nice warm white or cool white. Yeah. Um, it provides a nice balance for sure. Yeah. No closing question. Let me see, let me double check. I have to scroll down here. Oh, sorry, there was a couple more questions that came up. I didn't realize this was not scrolling. <laughs> um, if you could have a magic want wish, what would you like to wish for in your daily business? Woo! Uh, 28 hours a day, <laughs> just four more, just four more, I'd be happy. All right, I would agree there. I don't think I've had a 28, a short day like that in quite a while. <laughs> uh, what lighting concept do you find is the most difficult to clients? I'm, I'll say uh, we did one recently in the exhibition museum as we, we that, that's mainly what we do. Uh, there was a big room with white walls and a restriction on the objects or on the paintings at 50 lux and the client wanted it bright. So it's, it's like, there's something that you do not understand. If it's if your walls are white, your objects are limited to 50 lux, they will never be bright. Because there's you, you, you kind of battle between the interest, which is the object, and the mass, which is the white, the white. And you give a little bit of lighting onto the object, and your big white board just comes goes out, and then your object looks like completely uh in French, uh, dull, or, uh, you know, when a fire burns down, you know, it's kind of, uh, just a, I don't know the word. Just a smoldering, you know, kind of stuff. Yes, I mean, balancing with that luminance that's, that the wall is and, yeah. and your foreground object can definitely be a challenge there. Mm. Uh, and some clients don't understand how materials do matter in being able mm -hmm. to create the, the final lighting result they want. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's the scenographer, which is even, even more questionful. Yeah. You, if you do not know how your material works, it's, it's like, you know, okay, on a, on a second path, you know, Photoshop. Photoshop is my worst uh, enemy. Because if you can do lightning design with Photoshop, it means that we should, we should be able to do it. Very true. Uh, another question from an attendee, um, where do you go to continue learning about trends and new technology? Oh, uh, I, I go, I, I go, you know, I, I'm looking through LinkedIn a lot and there's a lot of nice articles. I'm, uh, I'm a member of ILD, IES, uh, uh, all of the, the, the papers that, that comes out, all the magazines I look. I look at them and, you know, sometimes you, you find an image that is really interesting and you start digging into it to understand how the lighting is working. Sometimes it's just, hey, that's a new fixture that comes out and you look at it and say, oh, that could be interesting in that project. So, yeah, that's it. It, it comes out from uh, everywhere. Yeah. Well, I think I'm trying to think how much time we have left. I don't want to. Um, is this good? Does this go till 530? Hi, Hi. Yeah. well, if there are no more questions, I think we can wrap it up. Um, so thank you, Alex. Thank you, Jared. It was, I, I hope it was as fun for you guys that for, it was for us to, to, to listen to you. We learned a lot. Thank you very much. So 
I think I think there's one question. Oh. Is it me? I uh, well, the lighting network influence your yes. path. Is it? Is that? That's the the last yeah. one, I believe. Eh? Yes. Uh, and re regarding public, okay. Well, light lighting network influence. I have to say that network is extremely important, and I I, I have a funny way to say to it is that. Why did I manage to work in lighting? It's because I play hockey. And I played hockey while I was at school with some theater people. And then one of those people were the project production manager of the Cirque du Soleil show. And that's how mm -hmm. he knew that I was doing lighting, that I did, I did like lighting. And that's how he managed to get me an interview. So. I, I have to say, if I do, if I if my career is in lighting, it is most probably because I play hockey with people in the th in theater. <laughs> as funny as it sounds, it, <laughs> network is yeah. about everything, everything. Yeah, very true. Even you know, we we think our our lighting world is such a small little bubble, but it really is an expansive um, a group of people and, and and companies that really make up what we do and who we are and uh and it extends beyond lighting you know the connections we make with the clients and projects yeah. for sure yeah and you know some 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 clients became uh friends also yeah so yeah. there was one other question here but i i i don't think it's clear enough clear for me to for you to answer um it was a question regarding public space lighting and security uh, and, and maybe it's, uh, I think they're asking maybe your personal thoughts on public space lighting and security, um, but I'm not 100% clear. Uh, yeah, I'm reading it as we speak. Uh, hmm. uh, I, I, I don't know what to say. As yeah. long as, you know, yeah, some outside, you know, if security is an issue, yeah, it has to be uh, it tackled with. Yeah. Uh, should we overlit just to make sure that there's no security issue? I think it's, a, it's unfortunately, it's a balance of risk reward. But as soon as you're going to have a risk, the, 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 you know, everything is going to have to be up and to make sure that nothing happens at another time soon. So. I don't know if that was around answering the question. Yeah, it can be it can be very tricky for sure because we do work in certain cities or municipalities, and and some towns and cities have specific requirements if if the public spaces are within their jurisdiction for security lighting, but you're still trying to create a welcoming space. You don't necessarily want to create a floodlit space that's flat and lifeless. Um, yeah. And I think as lighting designers, we find strategies of lighting perimeters and, and, and reducing shadows in certain areas to help create a sense of safety, uh, you know, and, and being careful with our uniformity and our app and how we layer lighting into the space. So, um, you know, I think there's a way to make a space feel safe and secure, uh, an outdoor public space without necessarily, again, it's about quality over quantity. Yeah, okay? exactly. It's where, where you put your light. And yeah. you know, there's the balance between the, the 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 contrast and the evenness. You know, if it's all even, it's dull. If it's too contrasted, you may not feel safe. So, how do we find the right balance between those those two? Yes. Oh, well, that's, uh, I think that wraps it up for our questions. Yeah. Thank you all. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Thanks again, <laughs> Alex and Jared. Again, we uh, I hope you had uh, as much fun as we we had uh, listening to you guys. Yeah. Uh, for everybody that joined us, uh, thanks again, um, and be sure to join us again for Designer by Designer on February twenty fourth, when Alex will be interviewing Celine Ar Arginelli from the ILD New York chapter. Registration to join us on Zoom will open soon, and of course, you can join us. Um, Yes, him and rewatch and uh, rewatch uh, any of the designer by designer interviews and all of the ILD's video content on the ILD YouTube channel. Make sure to subscribe. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you again. Have a great day. Thank you.